Hello and welcome to the Top Story, a podcast with the headlines of the day from our correspondents around the world. I'm Xi Zhu. Coming up in this edition, the WHO's polio vaccination campaign in Gaza has successfully reached over 82 percent of the targeted children in the war-torn territory. In Japan, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party is selecting a new leader who will become the country's next prime minister. And representatives from over 100 countries and regions, including the U.S., Russia, Ukraine, and Israel, gather in the Chinese capital for the Beijing Xiangshan Forum on Defense and Security. We begin in the Middle East. Palestinian health authorities say the World Health Organization's polio vaccination campaign in Gaza has reached over 82 percent of the targeted children in the territory. Children in the northern parts of the enclave have received their doses. This comes despite the Israeli army's obstruction of a convoy of vehicles carrying supplies and personnel for the vaccination campaign. Alina Eliazi spoke with health workers and parents in the region about the difficulties they are facing. UN officials said health workers with the polio vaccination campaign arrived in northern Gaza on Tuesday. The campaign plans to vaccinate 100,000 children. Health and relief officials said that the third phase of the vaccination campaign in northern Gaza is extremely complicated due to restrictions on movement. New evacuation orders for areas with vaccination centers and fuel shortage. The campaign went well today, and there was a large turnout from the people. This phase is considered a continuation of the vaccination campaign that took place in the central and southern Gaza Strip. Through the campaign, we aim to reach every Palestinian child under the age of 10 in order to immunize these children against the disease and prevent the spread and outbreak of the disease caused by the occupation. The families of the Palestinian children waited since early morning at the designated medical centers. In order to ensure that their children would receive the vaccination, in light of the difficult conditions experienced by the northern areas of the Gaza Strip, we hope that the vaccination will reduce the severity of the widespread diseases and prevent the transmission of infection from one person to another, because we live in very crowded places inside the displacement schools. So we are very happy that they are receiving the vaccination. At the same time. Many displaced people expressed uncertainty about immunizing their children against disease due to the miserable conditions in which the children live in, and the severe shortage of food supplies in the northern areas of the Gaza Strip. For me, as a mother, I see that vaccination will not change anything for the children because they still suffer from malnutrition and vitamin deficiency. So we hope that the conflict will end and food supplies will be allowed in, and this is more important, in my opinion, than the vaccination itself. The mass polio vaccination campaign concluded on Monday in central and southern Gaza, where more than 446,000 children. Have been vaccinated since the campaign began on the 1st of September, according to the World Health Organization. The campaign aims to vaccinate more than 640,000 children under the age of 10 in the Gaza Strip through two vaccination rounds targeted by weeks. That was Elena Al Yazi reporting. Still in Gaza. The civil defense agency in Hamas-run territory reports that an Israeli airstrike has killed at least 14 people in central Gaza, including two children. The strike hit a UN school sheltering displaced Palestinian families. The UN Palestinian Refugee Agency has confirmed that six of its staff members died in the airstrike. The Israeli military said it was targeting Hamas militants planning attacks from inside the school. Meanwhile, Israel has been increasing operations in the West Bank. The Palestinian Red Crescent Society has reported five deaths as a result of Israeli airstrikes in two bus. Jonathan Regev has more from Tel Aviv. 
Part of a basically a ongoing operation all across uh, the uh, West Bank. Uh, Tubas is uh, just outside uh, the city of uh, Tulkarem, which is on uh, the western edge of uh, the uh, West Bank, very close to what is known here as the Green Line, separating the West Bank from Israel proper. But, uh, the Israeli activity all along uh, the West Bank has not really stopped. Uh, we spoke about two weeks ago about an ongoing operation in the cities of Jenin and uh, Tulkarem. It may have come to an uh, official end at a certain time, but the operation is ongoing all the time in Jenin, in Tubas, forces coming in, coming out. This specific uh, uh, attack targeting five uh, militants. Uh, Israel uh, uh, claims these were uh, five people involved in various uh, terror acts, uh, and they were targeted from uh, the air and killed overnight in uh, Tubas. And uh, I think this is part of what we're seeing as a, a major escalation in violence on one hand and uh, in Israeli operations on the one hand all across the West Bank in the past few months. Uh, just hours after this uh, uh, incident in uh, Tubas, uh, there was another incident uh, further to the east, not far from the Palestinian city of Ramallah, in which a Palestinian truck driver ran over uh, an Israeli soldier, uh, killing him eventually. Uh, and so, so we're speaking of a lot of violence all across uh, the West Bank, not only in Jenin and Nablus, uh, the focal points of militant activity over the past few weeks, but recently also in uh, Tubas, near Tulkarem, near Amala, even further south, near, near Hebron. Uh, the, the West Bank is boiling from militant activity on one hand and Israeli activity on the other. That was Jonathan Regev in Tel Aviv. In North America, three major wildfires have scorched more than 45,000 hectares in Southern California in less than a week. Governor Gavin Newsom's office has deployed nearly 6,000 firefighters, soldiers and first responders, along with 50 helicopters and 140 water tankers. However, the region's latest heat wave and challenging terrain have complicated the rescue efforts. It is Tian Shan reports from Los Angeles. The satellite images show plumes of smoke from multiple wildfires that besieged Southern California over the past week. The line fire has burned through 14,000 hectares in San Bernardino County for almost a week, and it's only 14% contained. The terrain is very difficult terrain, some inaccessible areas for the crews to reach to be able to fight this fire uh, aggressively and safely. A 34-year-old man has been arrested on arson charges for allegedly starting the fire that continues to threaten more than 65,000 structures in the area. But the cause for the airport fire in the Orange and Riverside counties is still under investigation. Since Monday, it's burned over 9,000 hectares and it's 0% contained. And even though we did have some rainfall under the fire, um, it creates erratic winds, which in turn spread embers and make the fire grow. The line and airport fires have collectively turned the skies orange in some areas prompting authorities to close some schools in at least 10 districts due to poor air quality. And a third major blaze, the bridge fire, is the fastest growing among them as it exploded into nearly 20,000 hectares in just a matter of three days, as California's latest heat wave has only fueled the flames. This summer has been a, a very long, hot summer, so the heat has dried the fuels exponentially, causing them to be uh, very um, uh, susceptible to, to flame, right? And uh, it causes them to spread even faster than what they normally would. So just a change in weather, as far as having a very long summer and a very hot summer, it's what's made this incident and any other incident in California uh, very significant. California fire officials worry and say this is not even peak fire season yet. That was it is Tian Shan with the latest on the wildfires in California. In Asia, Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party is electing a new leader who will most likely become the country's next prime minister. Terence Tarashima is here to tell us about the main candidates and what's at stake. The upcoming Liberal Democratic Party leadership election, scheduled for later this month, is unique. The votes will still be cast by both Diet members and the party's rank and file. But unlike past LDP leadership elections, alliances between major factions will no longer play a part in selecting a winner. 
Factions have been dissolved after a major money funding scandal. Local media report the race will be hotly contested and that no one will seize a majority in the first round. Diet members will hold a key in the event of a runoff vote. But experts say there's a simple way to predict a winner. There's an upper house election scheduled for next year, followed by the Tokyo Metropolitan Assembly election and lower house election. Mr. Koizumi has said he will dissolve the Diet as soon as he becomes LDP president and a prime minister. Whoever is elected and becomes the face of the party will determine public support, so the new party leader should be someone popular among the general public. The prominent candidates are currently former environmental minister Shinjiro Koizumi, a young outspoken politician who is popular among the public. He is also the son of former prime minister Jun Ichiro Koizumi. Also the former LDP secretary general Shigeru Ishiba, who has held a number of ministerial posts including as defence minister and believes he's done the most for regional areas. An economic security minister, Sanai Takaichi, who has served in several ministerial posts under former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. She's also looking to become the first Japanese woman to become Prime Minister. I hear a lot of pledges from the candidates that they will change the LDP, but I feel that the LDP policies have always deviated from the key issues. I want to know what concrete policies the LDP will outline for us. The candidates have campaigned on the streets of Tokyo, but in many cases the public seems to be unconvinced that the LDP can select the right leader for the country. The elected candidates will also face diplomatic challenges that Fumio Kishida shouldered, but experts say Tokyo foreign policy is unlikely to change. There may be some differences, but the foreign policies are not likely to change. Policies against the U.S., against China or South Korea are not likely to change. There will still be policies made by the LDP. The candidates will get a chance to debate on Saturday, giving the public an opportunity to compare their vision and ideas. Finally, and most importantly, the elected candidate faces another big challenge, drawing up a list of new cabinet ministers and senior party officials. He or she has to send a message that this will be a new and reformed LDP. That was Terence Taroshima reporting from Tokyo. Finally, representatives from over 100 countries and regions, including the United States, Russia, Ukraine and Israel, are attending the Beijing Xiangshan Forum. The Defense and Security Forum focuses on building trust and resolving doubts through dialogue and communication. Its plenary sessions will touch upon topics such as improving international security frameworks, maintaining peace and development in the Asia-Pacific region, and achieving a balanced and orderly multipolar world. Li Xuan has been exploring the forum. The 11th Beijing Xiangshan Forum is centered around the theme of promoting peace for a shared future. Sessions will cover issues ranging from security cooperation and the role of developing countries in global security to goals and direction for regional security and development. And also AI security, the use of AI in the military and whether to incorporate it as a norm will also be discussed. Earlier, I spoke with several members of the media. Uh, much of the attention this year is on China-U.S. relations. The U.S. Defense Department has sent a delegation here at the forum led by Michael Chase, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for China and Mongolia. Um, this follows the two countries' theater commanders holding in-depth talks um, just on Tuesday morning. You know, how the two countries get along and whether we'll see more dialogues between the two militaries will be a major topic here um, at this year's forum. And also amid growing uh, flashpoints in Russia and Ukraine, Gaza and the West Bank and Sudan, many participants here are expecting China to make some kind of difference. Several delegates have expressed that China is playing an inc uh, increasingly active role as peacemaker. So it's worth watching if practical and effective solutions to settle disputes and conflicts will come out of uh, multilateral talks in the, uh, over the coming days. That was Li Shuang reporting from the Xiangshan Forum in Beijing. 
Now recapping the headlines, the WHO's polio vaccination campaign in Gaza has successfully reached over 82% of the targeted children in a war-torn territory. Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party is electing a new leader who is expected to become the country's next prime minister. And representatives from over 100 countries and regions, including the U.S., Russia, Ukraine and Israel, have gathered in the Chinese capital for the Beijing Xiangshan Forum on Defense and Security. And that's it for this edition of The Top Story, a podcast that brings you world headlines every weekday. For more news in politics, business, sports and culture, you can subscribe to The Beijing Hour, a one-hour podcast news magazine program. We welcome and appreciate all ratings and reviews. I'm Qi Zhi. Thanks for listening.